In this little box, I have something that might be extremely relevant to the first human landing on Mars in 20 or 30 years from now. So I believe that the first human to walk on Mars is already born. And it's maybe just now attending an elementary school in Beijing or, I don't know, in, in Vienna or who knows what. I won't tell you what's in this box, by the way. <laughs> so let's take a mental journey. Let me take you on a mission of exploration. This is your first day on Mars. So imagine you're stepping out of the spacecraft, stretching you in the spacesuit, which is cumbersome, about 100 kilogram mass altogether. It's a spacecraft to wear, basically. The temperature is around uh, minus 70 degrees Celsius, so it's a typical morning on Mars. The atmospheric pressure is uh, about um, like 1% uh, of what we have on the Earth. Very soft winds, you can barely feel through the spacesuit. You have about one third of a gravity level, which means if you could jump one meter on Earth, you could jump three meters on Mars, for example. There's an entire world in front of you to explore. These are actual real images from the Mars Science Laboratory Curiosity exploring Mars as we speak. Some of the pictures I'm showing you from Mars, they're less than a few weeks old, actually, from a different world. So this actually sounds like science fiction here, but it is actually what we do in our day job, so to say. Um, make sure for the daily schedule you check the green hat, because that's where your lunch grows. Uh, if you drink water from Mars, you can do that. Make sure it's thoroughly processed, otherwise it's going to be super salty and yucky. You're not going to drink more than one sip or so, I guess. So, but that's your workplace from now on until the end of the mission in one year, until your journey goes back, 200 days of transit time with five more people you really got to know extremely well. <laughs> Maybe more than you like. Now, so when you think of Mars nowadays, uh, you think of a picture like this. It's a dry, barren, cold desert. But we know it has not been like this dry, cold, radiation-exposed desert all the time. Because we have literally an invasion from Earth happening right now, there where we have two operational ro robotic vehicles on the ground. We have more than five spacecrafts uh, in, in, in orbit right now, and they are keep growing. There are more. 2018, we're going to have the ExoMars mission from the European Space Agency. 2020, the next, the follow-up mission to the MSL rover you see in the picture right here. So this is one of the, by the way, one of the most famous selfies ever taken, not on this, this world. <laughs> when I gave this presentation in a school class, and I showed this picture, uh, somebody showed, I said, ah, yeah, they're the footsteps of the photographer on the left here. <laughs> uh, no, that's where you scoop out the, uh, the rocks, basically, of course, from, from the rover itself. So I do have colleagues sitting in Chet, Chet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena. When they go home after working in the, in the control rooms, and they say, well, honey, how was your day? He, uh, they say, well, yeah, just as usual, I was uh, roving with a nuclear power-driven uh, rover on Mars, shooting, uh, shooting rocks with my giant laser there. That's a normal day there. Now, so the one thing all those probes tell us is that life was possible on Mars a long time ago. So the question is if it was ever inhabited. It was habitable, but that doesn't mean inhabited. So we are able to tackle this question for the first time, that up, up to like 3.5 billion years ago, there were oceans on Mars, we know for sure. They, gone, they were gone, and most of the water got lost. Some of that actually stayed on the surface as well. So that's where my day job comes in, and that's, I'm pretty just talking about the, my, my day work uh, in, the, in the suit lab. So here in Austria, we have with the Austrian space from the uh, Space Suit Laboratory in Innsbruck, just on the other side of the country, where I'm building this, actually it's a her, it's a princess called Auda. The X stands for experimental. It's a 40 45 kilogram spacecraft to wear. It's one of the most advanced systems in the world. There are only four teams worldwide which are working on experimental spacesuit simulators for Mars, and we are the only European team right now. Uh, and it can mimic all the major limitations an actual spacesuit would have on Mars. Like you can, you have all the restrictions on the one hand, it's heavy, it takes about three hours to put it on, it weighs 45 kilograms, so, so like, like working in the, having a stroll in a spacesuit, it's a crass understatement so to say. Now, on the other hand, there's a lot of technology involved. We have a sensor network, it measures your heartbeat, you can talk to the suit because of voice recognition, you can actually have gesture control with accelerometers uh, in, the, um, uh, in the gloves, for example. Uh, you can eat, you can drink, you can go to the toilet in the suit, you know, because three hours of donning, that's, that's not a good combination. 
Um, there's lots of high tech inside. There's a little bit of low tech, like little things like uh, we call it the RFD wrestle frazzle device, which means when you're inside the suit and your, your nose starts to itch, you cannot scratch it. <laughs> and believe me, sneezing inside a spacesuit is a very bad idea. <laughs> okay? So we have this little RFD, it's a foam. Every astronaut has his own, so we don't share that one. And you can literally rub in your, your nose there, so to say. So once we build this thing in the spacesuit laboratory, we want to break it next. So we are very good at breaking things under controlled uh, conditions, which means we bring it to field conditions which are somewhat resembling of certain aspects of the Martian environment. Like uh, we, we see how fine uh, you can work with your little fingers there with, with the cumbersome gloves. Uh, we take it to cryo chambers at minus 100 degrees Celsius, for example, and see if something breaks. Uh, for instance, we then go out to areas which are really astonishingly majestic. Like, for example, the Dachs giant, giant ice caves, so we went hundreds of, hundreds of meters below the surface uh, and, and see what's it like to work in the spacesuit uh, in a cave. Because we know there are caves on Mars as well, and we know there are astrobiological hotspots which are so super cool. If I would have a wish to Santa Claus, sorry, Chris Kind in Austria, uh, it would be cave climbing on Mars, I would say. Um, and so, because these are radiation-protected areas, very stable from the climate, for example. So, if life ever arose on Mars, I think caves would be a good starting point, because if life ever arose and the environmental conditions were deteriorating, this would be the place where life could retreat, because it's a stable, more stable environment. We call this so-called swan sea ecologies, where the last songs of life are sung on a planet which is deteriorating on the outside. So uh, these are really majestic areas. You see here, for example, a robot which is being lowered down on the rope with a geo-radar pointing right into the very old ice and looking for air bubbles and trapped particles, for example, together with the astronauts. So we are not really into, like, if we should send humans or robots to Mars, we say, well, let's send both of them, because they have their respective distinctive advantages, like the most expensive car I ever had the privilege to ride, the Eurobot ground prototype. Actually, Alexander Gerst, the German astronaut who just came back from a mission a couple of months ago, he took his driving license from the space station while driving this, this rover on the ground, actually, remotely controlled. I saw a certificate when he said, here's my driving license. Um, so it's a, a rover where you cannot just drive around, but it also has manipulator arms which help you to carry boxes or, or obtain soil samples. You can talk to the rover as well, it follows you like a dog. So it's somewhat a surrogate for a second astronaut which will be accompanying you as well there. So, yeah, so we go to Mars-like place on Earth, like this, for example. On the left side, that image has been taken on the 15th of February 2013, when we did a mission in Morocco. And this picture is not Photoshop. It was just after a sandstorm, so even the sky color is the correct one. And the picture on the right, you see here, that's been taken one week afterwards on Mars. These pictures are only one week apart, but two worlds apart. Yeah? And, and if you remove the white line in the middle and remove the text in the slide, you probably would have a hard time telling which is which, I would say. So once you are there in those missions, in those simulations, you know you are not on Mars, but you are not on Earth either completely. You're somewhere in, where in limbo, and that's a very magic moment when I realize this. So, of course, I, I, I always say you need to make... Be understand there's a lot of people behind this. So there's, uh, for those missions, for like for March 2013, we had more than 100 people from 23 nations participating. It is by definition one of the most beautiful inter international projects you can think of. It's bringing out the best in people like we always see in space flight. So this is a picture of the flight control teams we have who are, who are basically on Earth, so to say, and with some time delay, where they communicate with the team in the field. We have to cheat a little bit in the beginning because of technological constraints, like putting up a high-speed uh, data network in the middle of the nowhere, which is camel-proof, which you probably wouldn't need on Mars, uh, but on Earth as well. You have lots of robotic vehicles there. You have um, mobility schemes. I know this looks like fun, but it's serious science. I mean, who wants to drive with an air-conditioned spacesuit with a quad bike in the middle of the desert? I mean, <laughs> we also think about what happens if something goes wrong, if you break a leg. For that, we have inflatable habitation modules, which you bring along with your ATV. You can inflate it, and then inside, you just, just depending on how you put the hydraulics, you can put up a couch, a table. The only thing we got, forgot as a design flow, actually, was we didn't bring uh, the Beamer for the in-flight entertainment. Uh, <laughs> 
would be great to have your private movies down there. And you survive there for one, day, for one night until the rescue team hopefully arrives the next morning. So we are thinking about many scenarios. We are very good at being paranoid of what could go wrong. Uh, and this is one of the things you then need to try to, to know where your border conditions are. So you, you, you kick a lot of dust, obviously, up there. So when I see the movie The Martian, which I really enjoyed, great movie or so, and, and think of the, the tagline of the movie, bring him home, I say, hell no, don't bring us home. <laughs> Take us there. <laughs> hey. So... So we did just, just recently, these are really recent pictures actually I'm going to show you now, uh, at a glacier mission we did. Uh, we set the high altitude record for a Mars simulation uh, in general at 2,887 meters altitude at the Kalmatal Glacier in Western Austria, because there are glaciers on Mars as well, so we want to investigate this as well. By the way, uh, the astronaut, Enoch astronaut, who set that record, he comes from the Netherlands. So it's quite a delta he had in terms of setting the altitude record. We all envy him for that. Uh, so you're really in an area which is, um, it, it, it's, it's not the reddish desert sense you know from, from, the, from Morocco, for example, or from Mars, but you have to be aware that the environment on Mars is highly diverse. Uh, that means, yes, there are these flat surfaces where the rovers land because it's safer, but there are also canyons, there are caves on Mars, there are polar caps, you have swirling dust storms, you have, like, you know, uh, geological fault lines which make a Grand Canyon, which is about the size of the continental USA. You have a mountain there, actually a shield volcano, uh, which is three times the altitude of, of Mount Everest with a baseline of 600 kilometers. That's a mountain the size of France on the planet half the size of the Earth. So it's a planet which is really cool to walk on. It's probably the location in the solar system where we have the best chance of maybe finding life once, once one day. Now, um, we had the privilege of um, uh, being there at the end of our mission. It was a two-week, fairly short-duration mission, uh, where we were uh, at the time there where the Percy meteor shower would hit like every year in, 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 in mid-August. So we had the chance of ever ha having a nighttime extravehicular activity and just imagine this, this, you know, this pitch black dark sky with this brilliant majestic stars above you, no light pollution, you're very far away for, from every kind of civilization, then you have sh one shooting star after the other. And that was the moment when it struck me, when I realized, oh my gosh, just imagine, like in 20 or 30 years from now, somebody will be standing on Mars seeing that very sky I'm seeing right now with only one difference, because there's not Mars in the sky, in the night sky, but it's Earth. This is an actual image of Earth taken from Mars after sunset. This is us. This is a selfie. Huh? <laughs> um, if you spot out the pixel on the left, it might be you. Um, so, as Carl, Carl Sagan said about the first human standing on Mars, they will gaze up and strain to find the blue dot in their skies. They will love it no less for its obscurity and fragility. They will marvel at how vulnerable the repository of all our potential once was, how perilous our infancy, how humble our beginnings, how many rivers we had to cross before we found our way. And that brings me to that little box there. Of course, I'm going to show you what's inside. <laughs> uh, when meteorites hit the planet, and they come in at a very shallow angle, they can sputter off this material into space. That can happen. And most of this material gets lost deep in deep space, you're never going to see it again. A tiny little fraction of this might just make it to Earth after millions of years. And if you're very lucky, you can spot those particles on Earth. And if you're really, really lucky, you bring them to the, to the uh, laboratory. And because of the chemical signature, it tells you where, that, where it comes from. Every plant has a chemical passport, so to say, like a fingerprint, isotopic fingerprint. And so what's in there is nothing less than a marsh meteorite. And I promise I, you're going to have a chance to have a close-up look in the, in the break then, because it's probably even for the first row hard to spot here, but it's really here. You even see the fusion crust here. And here's my, um, my relevance to what I said at the beginning. Re I'm really deeply convinced the first human to walk on Mars is already born. And here's my wish to that person. When in 2045, the first human will step down from a spacecraft, you know, they're walking out of the ladder, they're putting the boots in the ground, taking a picture of the footprint, you know, 
for the for the history books. They're gonna say the first um, words, whatever that will be, uh, and 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 that's where the cameras will be switched off, I guess. And then I want that very person to fumble around in their spacesuit, take out this little friend here, look at it one last more time, put it down on the ground, and say, "You're home again." <laughs> Thank you.